There is nothing quite like a giallo film. The tension, the brutality, the seediness, the atmosphere, even the color, it all comes together to make the giallo genre special. But what is a giallo film? Gialli in plural. A giallo film is essentially a murder mystery thriller that's treated like a horror film. Sure, this is an oversimplification, for the giallo genre isn't quite so easily definable, but we can't let that stop us. Let's take a closer look at the giallo and at the historical context in which the genre came to be. The Italian film industry was, once upon a brief time, a globally dominant powerhouse. In the early days of feature-length cinema, Italian silent epics like Cabiria and The Last Days of Pompeii were exported worldwide to global critical and financial success. The films didn't suffer a language barrier, with the title card simply being translated, but alas, the good times did not last. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. With the double blow of silent film dying and fascism rising in Europe, the Italian film industry buckled. Only censorship-friendly films were produced, and those were usually light domestic wish-fulfillment comedies. The international community was disinterested. Then, with the arrival of neorealism in the post-World War II landscape, Italian films gained in esteem. Neorealism was a fully Italian expression, but while it met with boundless critical acclaim, it did not satisfy those keeping tabs on the box office coffers. More popular, more spectacular, and more westernized entertainment was sought. In 1960, the producers of Mario Bava's gothic ghost classic Black Sunday ended up getting paid more for the international distribution rights than the entire picture had cost to make. They very much wanted to repeat the experience. Inspired by international cinema, Italian filmmakers began deliberately copying American genre films, but doing them Italian style. Five distinct subgenres were born. They were the giallo, the spaghetti western, the Euro spy, a type of spy parody. You're the only man that can save us. The Polizio Tesho. Commissario, un momento, un momento. And the Peplum film. Together, these five genres dominated popular Italian cinema for decades. As they were interconnected, we will look at each, but of course, the giallo will get the bigger share of our time. Other Italian subgenres existed as well, specifically within the horror realm. These included the erotic horror film. Call him and tell him you've always been mine. <laughs> the Nazi exploitation. Spineless fool! A soldier of the Third Reich isn't supposed to get excited at any spectacle. The cannibal film. The zombie ripoff. But those we'll save for later episodes. Anyway. Before we delve into the giallo, let's start with the peplum film. It was, after all, the first distinct subgenre to arise. The word peplum is derived from peplos, a Greek attire from the antique era. Basically, a peplum film is a costume picture. They're also known as swords and sandals. Based on Greek and Roman mythology and history, the peplum genre became popular with the immense success of Hercules in 1958. The cheaply produced Italian film was a box office behemoth, and soon enough, Italy's filmmakers were producing dozens of strongman films every year. These films were usually kid-friendly adventure flicks, though with some sex and violence tossed in for good measure. They followed the distinctly Italian tradition of strongman epics, which had been popular back in the silent days as well. Here is Machiste, back in 1914, who after the success of Cabiria got a series of films based on his adventures. But Hollywood too had big hits with swords and sandal cinema. Granted, they were usually Bible epics, but they traversed the same realm and they were often produced in Italy. Ku Vadis, for instance, was one of MGM's biggest moneymakers in 1951, with epic stagings of Christians being fed to lions. 
the public went wild for it. So the year after Hercules made bank at the box office, the suits at MGM decided only a Roman era Bible epic could save them from financial ruin. MGM thus remade one of their biggest silent era hits, the 1925 classic Ben-Hur. With the new 1959 version, the studio saved itself from bankruptcy. Ben-Hur deservedly won several Academy Awards and to this day, no chariot race has ever been more spectacular. Like its silent predecessor, the William Wyler epic was shot on location in Italy. Ben-Hur and other productions like it put to use Italian cinematic craftsmen and assistant directors, giving them resources and training beyond their wildest dreams. Two filmmakers benefited immensely from the reinvigorated Italian film scene, Sergio Leone, who would pioneer the spaghetti western, and Mario Bava, who would pioneer the giallo. Both put what they'd learned to use in their own peplum films. Bava made a Hercules movie, appropriately adding a touch of horror by casting Christopher Lee as the bad guy. Leone went bigger doing The Colossus of Rhodes, one of the finest examples of Italian peplum, even as it is unusual for not featuring a strong man in the lead. Instead, it used the Cary Grant-esque American B-movie western star Rory Calhoun. The Colossus of Rhodes is a fascinating film that shows Leone's immense talent, and his ability to do big things with a relatively small budget. It also hints at Leone's great love for the western, with writing sequences shot in Ciudad Encantada, Spain. These sequences notably foreshadow the Dollars trilogy with Clint Eastwood. Later on, John Milius' sword and sorcery epic Conan the Barbarian was also shot here. As successful as the Peplum film was, Italian producers were oversaturating the market. It didn't help that Hollywood megaproductions like Cleopatra strained the Italian film business to the breaking point. Even Hollywood versions of the Swords and Sandal film were failing. Fall of the Roman Empire, shot on location in Spain, flopped to the tune of $126 million in losses when adjusted for inflation. The peplum genre was soon dead, or if not dead, then certainly dying. Yet all that Italian talent had to go somewhere. Local producers began looking at what worked internationally, and they came up with a few answers. Among their new genres to mass produce, the spy parody was the shortest lived. The James Bond series was incredibly popular, spawning imitations across the board. The Italians made perhaps the most brazen one on the market when they thrust O.K. Connery upon the world. O.K. Connery starred Sean Connery's younger brother Neil as a hypnotist surgeon called into service for Queen and Country. Bond veterans like Bernard Lee, Daniela Bianchi, Adolfo Celi, and Lois Maxwell all made appearances. Maxwell, famous as Miss Moneypenny, reportedly was so sought after by Italian producers that she made more money doing OK Connery than she did on all official James Bond films put together. Good for her! Even Mario Bava got in on the action with the spy comedy Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs, starring Vincent Price. Never mind that the film was awful, arguably the worst of Bava's entire filmography, and never mind that Bava desperately wanted out of the assignment, but was forced to stay on for contractual reasons. These films' success proved that the genre was commercially viable. However, after the Brits made their own spy parody in 1967, the commercially successful but critically lambasted Casino Royale, the subgenre faded away. Around the same time, Sergio Leone began producing his spaghetti westerns, making a star out of Clint Eastwood. In Hollywood, the word was that the western was dead, with Cinerama epics like How the West Was Won being among the last gasps of the formerly dominant genre. Leone proved Hollywood wrong, and some of the finest westerns produced in the late 1960s were Italian. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. These westerns also provided training for a soon-to-be giallo master, Dario Argento, who was one of the screenwriters on the masterpiece Once Upon a Time in the West. 
Mario Bava also did a couple of westerns in the 1960s, but his were less memorable and are now mostly forgotten. While I'd love to spend more time on the spaghetti westerns, it is about damn time we get to the honorable giallo, so let me just leave you with this. Check out Leone's films, but if you've already done that, don't forget to also look at the westerns of Sergio Corbucci, whose films Django and The Great Silence are notable classics. The giallo was the third genre that benefited from Peplum's death, but it wasn't quite as obvious a rising star as the spy comedy or the spaghetti western. Those genres were more obvious riffs on American material. The giallo, however, had to be created, or rather conjured up from various elements. Mario Bava was the man for the job. Bava was inspired by a German subgenre of crime thrillers, known as creamy. Now, in a previous episode, Mario Bava, the genre maker, a few of you thought my pronunciation was hilarious, and <laughs> of course it was. The word creamy sounds vaguely naughty, but in my defense, so is the giallo genre. And besides, this is how Tim Lucas pronounces it on his brilliant Blu-ray commentary track for Blood and Black Lace, so let's stick with it, cheeky illusions be damned. Now, speaking of the creamy, these films were ultra-violent, cheaply made, and often lurid crime movies. They were usually based on the pulp literary works of author Edgar Wallace, or at the very least inspired by them. Another clear influence were paperback crime books, sold in Italy, distinct with their yellow covers. Now, giallo actually means yellow in Italian, so that's where the term comes from. Mario Bava's The Girl Who Knew Too Much follows a tourist who arrives in Rome, only to witness a murder. Nobody believes her, but she soon finds herself the target of the killer. The film mixes the paranoia of horror with the more traditional mystery elements of the creamy. A clear influence was the cinema of Hitchcock, notable even as the title is a ripoff of Hitchcock's kidnapping classic, The Man Who Knew Too Much. However, Bava's film became an originator of a new genre. Several later giallo films deal with similar plot lines, with the hapless outsider stumbling into a gruesome murder plot. A notable example includes Dario Argento's directorial debut, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. One film alone does not make a subgenre, but in Bava's case, two films did. Blood and Black Lace followed in 1964, and the film is a brutal, borderline, masochistic nightmare journey into style and atmosphere. Blood and Black Lace focuses on a fashion house in Rome, where the models are being killed off, one after another. Made on a minuscule budget, Bava, like that other Italian master, Leone, manages to get a lot out of virtually nothing. And in Bava's case, it is even more impressive, given the absolute limited budgetary resources he had. For his roving, haunting tracking shots, Bava had to make due with a rolling children's cart. He couldn't afford a dolly. Blood and Black Lace added several further mainstays to the giallo subgenre, including vivid use of color, a masked, trench-coated killer, brutal, sexualized murders, and a distinct focus on mood over narrative. The genre had been established, and while there isn't a set rule of what encompasses giallo tropes, that would be too limiting, there were certainly now tropes that were repeated. Like, for instance, that the films focus on murder, that the hero or heroine gets dragged into a dark world, usually with an investigative element. Mental illness and psychological fragility features heavily in the plots. There's usually a heavy focus on sexual elements and nudity, which is matched by extreme violence, blissfully outdoing mainstream Hollywood cinema. There's often an overwhelming musical element, the titles were wild and bombastic, and the narrative is told with typical Italian focus on stylistic, elegant visuals. Let's take a closer look at each of these elements, starting with the most obvious one. The murders are usually spectacular and lurid, 
one cannot have a sleazy murder mystery without them. I'd argue the focus on murder is another detail inherited from Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace. The film is literally a series of killings. The Italian title is Sei Donne per l'assassino, which translates to Six Women for the Murderer. Nobody seemed to care that this was a spoiler. As for the hero, as already mentioned, they're dragged into the plot, usually by witnessing a killing. It was an adoption of Hitchcockian narrative, and while not necessarily committing fully to Hitchcock's wrong man style narratives, the Gialli heroes usually became obsessed with the cases, even when they were not themselves a suspect. How do I open the door? In The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, American expatriate Sam Dalmas, played by Tony Musante, comes across the scene of an attempted killing. He cannot leave it alone and starts investigating himself, putting his own life in danger. The same thing happens again in Argento's Deep Red, where a musician, played by David Hemmings, investigates the brutal murder of a psychic, feeling a sense of responsibility after discovering the body. Both films are top-ranked must-see giallo classics. This sense of obsessive pursuit can certainly be called a form of madness, but giallo films often delved more directly into madness and fragile states of mind, particularly if they featured female leads. In Lucio Fulci's A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, the heroine suffers drug-induced bouts of insanity, and much later in Dario Argento's The Stendhal Syndrome, a female police officer tracking a serial killer is yanked into an unstable mental state, impressively staged in a virtuoso opening sequence where she is pulled into works of art. The fragile woman trope tends to even outdo the man-on-a-mission trope in the Jolly movement. For instance, in The Red Queen Kills Seven Times, a woman is on the brink of hysteria after a bunch of people get killed all around her and she is the prime suspect. In The Strange Wise of Mrs. Ward, a woman slowly loses her grip on reality as people all around her keep dying, including her best friend. In The Perfume of the Lady in Black, our hero, Mimsy Farmer, sees more and more strange occurrences and reality seems to bend inwards around her. It drives her to oblivion. Though it's not only women in these films that are driven absolutely bonkers, in The Night Evelyn Rose from the Grave, a widowed husband is driven absolutely mad and is in danger of going back to the madhouse and thus losing his fortune to the next heir in line. So this can happen to men too. Though, to be fair, in The Night Evelyn Rose from the Grave, the male hero certainly did belong in a madhouse considering he deals with his grief by hiring prostitutes and then murdering them. So, you know. Madness truly is a part of this genre. The madness of the characters is often married to the sexual elements, with the killers committing their murders in a deeply sexual, often misogynistic way, such as in Black Belly of the Tarantula. And the sex naturally leads to violence, as creation and destruction are artistically and psychologically linked. The tender act of sex is rarely shown in giallo films, unless of course it is accompanied with some sort of violence or perversion. Depending on the film in question, there's often a reactionary element to this uneasy marriage, which is no surprise given that the 60s and 70s was the era where women's liberation finally began getting a cultural foothold. Italy was, and still remains, a deeply patriarchal society, so it is no wonder that the predominantly male cadre of Italian filmmakers would feel a sense of trauma in those changing times. The Gialli, for better or worse, reflects these changes, and the outcomes are often challenging. Because such feelings are so primal, the Giallo became a lens through which such difficult societally transitional topics were discussed. And of course, the Italians did it, with great style.
At the same time, there's an interesting and fascinating flip side of this, where progressive elements regarding feminism come into play. Edvige Fenech, leading actress of several Gialli, put it that her characters were often dolls of flesh and bone, and these dolls were treated quite poorly. But here's the fascinating thing. She was also the leading actress in The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, which was directed by Sergio Martino, one of the finest Giallo directors. We see a character that is fragile, that is victimized, and that is broken time and again mentally. But at the same time, she is a fascinatingly modern character with sexual perversions that would have gotten her killed in any previous genre movie. And she also takes a lover when her husband neglects her and turns out to be rather dull. Now, spoiler alert for this film, but in any horror film before and in most horror films since, a character that's this promiscuous would be punished. Yet in the end, Mrs. Ward survives. In fact, she bests all the men in the film. And she's even kind of promised a new boy toy to play with. Yes, the character is old-fashioned and outdated in many aspects, but it's also very modern. And this strange duality in giallo films between the modern and the traditional is a huge part of what makes the genre so successful, because it challenges the status quo even if it does it in a reactionary way. The films are put together in fascinating, sometimes narratively illogical ways, yet the need for narrative logic goes out the window in the giallo genre, with the focus instead going to cinematically emotional logic. There's a distinct touch of style present throughout any giallo worth its salt. The stylism pioneered by Mario Bava is repeated in such works as The Bloodstained Butterfly, Four Flies on Grey Velvet, and Black Belly of the Tarantula. The widescreen canvases are filled with focus on architecture and space, memorably seen here in The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, on character movement through a scene, clearly on display in Torso, and on visceral horror, as in A Lizard in a Woman's Skin. <laughs> This bravura effect shot, featuring a mutilated dog puppet, got the filmmakers in trouble. Italian police officials could hardly believe special effects artist Carlo Rambaldi had made this moment in his workshop. Rambaldi would later win Oscars for his work in King Kong, Alien, and E.T. Bravura work was not limited to directors and effects artists. The giallo composers would not be outdone. Ennio Morricone scored several films, bringing the giallo narratives to life with haunting, lyrical, and challenging scores. The rock band Goblin's musical score for Deep Red went in another direction, less traditionally orchestral and far more progressive in style. It is one of the most famous horror scores of the 1970s. There are two more composers I'd like to mention. There's Bruno Nicolai, who made some of the most popular giallo scores. And then there's Honora Orlandi, who did the score for The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, which is both haunting, sexual, and lyrical. This combination works and makes it one of the most giallo-esque giallo scores. Finally, there's the distinctive giallo titles. They're equally bombastic and memorable, with either a focus on raw, in-your-face titles like these, Spasmo, Eyeball, Orgasmo, or elaborate, fantastically poetic and sometimes downright mystifying titles such as these, Your vice is a locked room, and only I have the key, The iguana with the tongue of fire, The man with the icy eyes, Forbidden photos of a lady above suspicion. Five dolls for an August moon. The house with laughing windows. 
Now, like I already stated, these films sometimes veered from the norm. There is no set rule that states a giallo film has to be exactly one way. For instance, Dario Argento's Suspiria is sometimes called a giallo. Personally, I think of it more as a dark fantasy horror hybrid, but if you disagree, I won't quarrel with you. Variation was common within the giallo genre, and that's a good thing too, given how many gialli were produced in the 60s, 70s and early 80s. For instance, Mario Bava's Hatchet for the Honeymoon stood in contrast to the genre norms, in that the lead character is revealed to be the murderer from the get-go. Another anomaly is Black Belly of the Tarantula, which featured a policeman as its lead character, instead of going with a more traditional witness. The lead was played by veteran actor Giancarlo Giannini, who later made a memorable appearance as Inspector Pazzi in Ridley Scott's operatic Hannibal. Here, in the Paolo Cavara-directed giallo classic, Giannini is on the trail of a brutal killer, and the case grows ever more nightmarish. Stylistically, Black Belly of the Tarantula is slightly more restrained than the average giallo, except for flashes when it decides absolutely not to be. The marriage of the policeman and the giallo-style killer makes for a particularly memorable entry into the genre. The film is also interesting because it crosses slightly over into the Italian poliziotesci genre, which was basically Italy's answer to hard-boiled American crime films like The French Connection. Sometimes that link was obvious, as with this film, The Italian Connection. Gee, I wonder where they got the title. However, the poliziotesci did not feature horror elements, and thus is different from the more mystery-oriented gialli. The poliziotesci subgenre also didn't last as long, appearing in the late 1960s and being virtually extinct in the early 1980s. The other Italian subgenres were also dying. The Swords and Sandal film was long gone, though Italian ripoffs of Swords and Sorcery films replaced them. The spy parody had never truly come into its own, though a few parodies came and went, until comedian Mike Myers struck gold with the Austin Powers franchise, which itself was a direct parody of Mario Bava's Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs, as well as its predecessor, the Norman Taurog directed Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. The spaghetti western was also absent, and Hollywood's prognostication that the western was dead had finally come through. The massive failure of Heaven's Gate in 1980 certainly didn't help. Sergio Leone, the undisputed king of the spaghetti western, was now making the epic gangster picture Once Upon a Time in America, and was later planning on tackling the Battle of Stalingrad. Alas, he died just as the proposed war epic was entering pre-production. A big reason for the demise of these subgenres was the advent of VHS. Italy's habit of producing cheap genre pictures was suddenly challenged. Home video rentals and ownership demanded content, and low-budget filmmakers in the US were more than happy to fill the role, often with direct-to-video product. But somehow, despite this, the giallo endured. Several more giallo films went into production throughout the 1980s. Most of the credit for this must go to Dario Argento, who was the preeminent giallo filmmaker of the 1970s, and by pure stubbornness remained so in the 1980s. Several of his 80s gialli are classics of the genre. Other filmmakers also swung for the fences. Lucio Fulci, who had already directed gialli like Perversion Story, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, and Don't Torture a Duckling, pushed boundaries by making one of the most violent and arguably most pornographic giallo films of all time, The New York Ripper. You didn't really expect to find me in the boat, did you? <laughs> the film features a killer who talks like a duck and slices up women's breasts with razors. The film is deservedly notorious, and if you can stomach the brutality and the misogyny, it is well worth checking out but there was no denying that the genre was fading. Fast. Giallo cinema was a reflection of its time, of the rapidly changing social mores of Italian society, 
and of the international appetite for lurid dark thrillers. In the consumerist 80s, tastes were changing. By the 90s, only Dario Argento and a few others kept the tradition going. And in our past two decades, the genre has been functionally retired. Argento tried staging a giallo comeback with a new thriller starring Adrian Brody. It was suitably called Giallo, but the production was troubled, and the resulting film is a hot mess. Yet still, I refuse to declare the Giallo dead, because we see the legacy of the Giallo in cinema language. Hitchcock's Frenzy and Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now were both directly influenced. So was the eyes of Laura Mars. Slasher films like Halloween and Friday the 13th were inspired by Mario Bava's A Bay of Blood, a proto-slasher which itself had evolved from Bava's giallo origins. Brian De Palma made Dress to Kill and Body Double, Hollywood movies for sure, but about as close as you can get to a giallo in American filmmaking. In the 1990s, the erotic thriller became a mainstay. Basic Instinct was a smash hit, and other films like Color of Night, Jade, and Sliver followed. They all focused on themes already deeply probed by the gialli. For instance, the broken mentality of the female lead in Color of Night seems directly related to similar fractured, sexualized female characters in films like A Lizard in a Woman's Skin. In other words, the giallo endures. I think we'll see its influence come back time and again. Sometimes it will be a subtle reminder, and sometimes it will be an obvious homage. We should be damn glad for it, for the giallo was special. It may not have been narratively innovative, but it was stylistically and emotionally innovative. Personally, I think and hope we'll see more films influenced by the genre in coming years. And I think we'll even see modern giallo films made. Hell, we already have. So I say, long live the giallo. May it soon return in triumph. This is History of Horror. If you liked the episode, I'd sure appreciate it if you liked, shared, and subscribed. Also, if you want to check out some of my other works, I'm an author. My science fiction novel, God of Desolation, is currently available on Amazon, and my upcoming urban fantasy mystery novel, Richly Drawn, will be available from Inkshares.com in 2022. Thanks a plenty. <laughs>